welcome to our meetup here at Holberton School. Uh, my name is Shannon. I'm batch four, the newest batch here at Holberton School. Um, our meetup today, how to entertain millions through code with Ludovic Galibert of Netflix. We all know about Netflix and chill. We've been talking about that all day. Um, <laughs> Ludovic is senior software engineer with Netflix. He is um, experienced with Java and mobile, mobile development, both Android and iPhone SDK. Um, today we have two more Batch 4 students doing a little bit of an interview. We're going to be talking with him um, for about an hour or so, you know, getting to know Ludovic yeah. and what he does and what he's about. We have Sue from Batch 4. Welcome, Sue. As well as Lee from Batch 4. Um, and yeah, that's what we're doing here today. So I'm going to turn this over to Sue and Lee. Thank you very much, Shannon. So let's get started, I guess. Right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I'll try to move it. Right. Yeah, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Um, I'm French, uh, as you can tell. Uh, I actually never worked in France. I studied in Germany and worked in Germany for about 12, 15, 15 years, something like that. And I moved to the U.S. about five years ago. Um, I transferred from my previous company in Germany to uh, the, the uh, American branch in Palo Alto. And about three years ago, I moved to Netflix. Um, yeah. Hey, that's great. So um, what were some of the main differences uh, between the work culture in Germany and here in the U.S.? Uh, there's a lot. Uh, ooh. Is that too loud? Is that fine? <laughs> Sounds clear. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest differences is, um, what was that? So uh, one of them is def definitely decision making. Uh, at least one of the ones I definitely s felt mo much more. It's more, it's very consensual in Germany. So you have a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions. And it takes a while, and then you get to a decision. And then when you get to that decision, you actually get to the implementation part. <coughs> so it took a lot of meeting, probably too many meetings for me. Uh, and, and in the US, it's more top down, the decision making. So it's not necessarily your boss will take the decision, but you will uh, have less discussion. You will focus less on these discussions, and you will start implementing quicker. And if you have more context and need to, ch to change your implementation, that's not a problem. You will, will, you will be able to change it. It's harder when you're in a German work culture. Uh, another thing is feedback. Uh, in Germany, people will give you feedback more directly, generally, or a disagreement will also be more, um, more emotional, or not, not emotional, more confrontational. So it's not a bad thing, but it, it's, it's very different. In, in the US, it's more, it's more held back. So you will, the feedback will be a little less direct, and it's usually not confrontational. So you won't stand up to someone in a meeting and tell them in their face that you're disagreeing. It's a little different. Uh, other things are um, that in, in Germany, you can fire someone easily. So it's a whole different mindset. You can, be, you can come in the office, and it's not like on that day that your boss will tell you, Sorry, you're gone. It's like it's a it's a more it's a longer process. You need a, a real reason to fire someone. It takes a while, and so it definitely it's it's definitely different. Um, another thing is work hours. Typically here, no one really looks at how long you work, or you don't typically count your hours. You get the work done. In Germany, it's more. Uh, focus a little more, at least in my experience, there was sometimes more focus on you spend eight hours, work 40 hours a week, it's eight hours a day, you've done your eight hours and you, you're you done for the day, that's it. These are, these are some of the cultural differences. Uh, a few months ago I read a book called The Culture Map by Erin Meyer, which, which is great, it tells about, it maps different, wa the world cultures on different scales in eight particular topics like communication, uh, leadership, 
um, decision making, all these kinds of things. And you see the countries on that scale and they're relative to each other and you can see the differences. It's, it's very interesting. So I definitely recommend that book if, uh, if you want to learn about different cultures. And actually it's very helpful when you're coming from a different culture like me when I'm French and I work in Germany and I'm in the US, it's, it's very helpful to know how to adjust your like communication style, for example. Okay, that's, that's great. So what were some of your um, struggles just coming from Germany and working in the US market? So just as I mentioned, the, um, the communication was one of the things. Uh, France is generally a, a higher context culture. So we tend to do things like we explain, when we explain something, we will, uh, we'll have a brief overview and tell the thesis and then the anti-thesis and then the conclusion. But in the US, typically, if you don't get to the point right away, they won't read your email. It's like, <laughs> it's, like it's way too long. And um, so I had to adjust to that and, and start uh, making my point at the beginning and then finally explaining the rationale behind, behind these things. So uh, yeah, I'm still working on it. I still occasionally write way too long emails, but uh, that's, that's definitely one of the things I'm still working on and uh, I struggled with. Um, what else? Um, communication was one feedback oh yeah the, so the feedback thing same thing as I mentioned feedback in general is more direct and um, and also disagreement and more confrontational and even so in France you're typically hand waving and, and talking loud and um, so here it's it's way different but so I used to have sometimes meetings in Germany where I would I, I was confrontational so I would disagree and I would say in the meeting, and it would be, it wouldn't be like I would have done here. Because I knew the people for a long time. I worked in that previous company for 12 years in Germany. So I knew the people really well. And uh, so it was easier for me to be confrontational. Uh, when I came to the US, I didn't know the people as much. So I, I definitely toned it down. And that, at least that was good for me. Um, so communication and uh, Decision making, uh, another thing, as I mentioned, it's more consensual in Germany, so you discuss things a lot. In the US, you will, you will discuss things, but probably way less than we did in Germany. So you might have less information, or you might start implementing things with less information. And sometimes, it, it, at least at the beginning, felt like you would, get, you would get less context. So that was something I had to adjust for. Okay, so I was just wondering from all this, um, how did you score your first internship when you just got into the market? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I got, uh, I got lucky. I started working, uh, I, I started studying in Germany uh, at the US University of Saarland. And um, I was working at a, as an intern, well actually my first internship was, uh, I was studying in Germany and there was that other fellow student. He was an, also an intern at that, uh, first company called Interactive Software Solutions. And he said, hey, do you want to uh, work as an intern in a company and learn Java? I said, sure, I'll do that, yeah. And so he introduced me to his CEO. This was a startup, basically. So he introduced me to the CEO, said, um, do you know anything about programming? No, you want to learn Java? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and that, 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 there was no formal interview. That was really no technical interview. So I, I got really lucky on that one. And my second job, my second internship, which was at the company where I stayed for 12 years, actually, well, 12 years in Germany and then two years in the US, uh, it was basically the same thing. That, that same guy moved to that company and said, hey, do you want to come? It was perfect because it was, the company was located on the campus. And so it was like a five minutes walk from the office to, uh, to the lectures. And then when I didn't have lectures, I went back to the office. Uh, that was super convenient. Oh, but wow. same thing, no formal interview, so I, I got really lucky. That's pretty cool. So before your, your first inter internship, were you interested in programming? Uh, yeah, it wasn't something I thought I, I need. I wanted to be a software engineer. I, did, I, w I was interested, but it was not something I was thinking about. For me, it was more a side job where I could make good money to, to pay for the bills and pay for the university. And, and I could learn something new. But then, then it just, I just stuck with it. 
and it turned into what is now a career of over 20 years as a software engineer. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for making me much younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so you, you started out as an intern, and you've had, you've had experience as a director in managing other engineers. Yeah, de uh, deputy director. Or deputy director. Yes. Um, what would you say are some good characteristics <coughs> that software engineers have? Um, I would so there are some some who are obvious, some are probably less obvious. I would say you should definitely enjoy what you're doing. Uh, if you don't have a passion for it, it's it's hard to keep at it. Uh, if you love programming, then it it's it, you you'll definitely be able to tell that these are good engineers. Um, also, be should be uh, resilient and de determined because you will stumble upon, you will have complex problems to solve, you'll have complex issues to debug, you'll have deadlines, time pressures, you'll have um, some problems within the team, with other teams, so you, you definitely need to be resilient to all these things. So it's not always easy, but as long as you're determined and resilient against all those things, uh, it, it will help a lot. Um, so that, um, yeah, definitely be a team player. So you can't, you can't make it by yourself. Uh, you can, there are some people, what we call brilliant jerks, but in the long term, <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, you can do it. You, you can work on your own, but ultimately you'll have to work with other people within, across the company. So, um, you, you have to be able to be a team player. But also, on the other hand, you have to be able to be independent. You have to be able to, to take a task. You know something needs to get done. You take it. You just, you just go all the way with it by yourself. You don't need directions. You work on it by yourself. That's definitely important. Uh, don't underestimate things like um, uh, social skills and communication, generally soft skills. Uh, social skills and communication, you, you'll have to talk to a lot of people. I, I, maybe not in, well, I think usually you'll have to talk to a lot of people. I work, uh, I have some very cross-functional uh, projects with a lot of different teams at Netflix. And if, if, you're, if you can't talk to them clearly and work well with them, that's not gonna work. Your project is not gonna work. Um, yeah, these, is, I think there was something else I wanted to mention. But these are definitely the most important things, I would say, amongst others. There's, there's a lot of things. But. Oh, that's, that's great. So um, what skills do you need uh, to acquire, to, like, to become a senior engineer at Netflix? Um, so for Netflix specifically, or generally Netflix only hires generally uh, senior engineers. So it's, it's, you won't often see, I, I've never seen interns on Netflix. Uh, so it's not really about the skill to acquire, it's more about the experience you've gained over the years, for Netflix at least, specifically. And then for the interviews, uh, any, any type of interviews here in Silicon Valley you know, or generally in tech, it's, it's all about preparation. So you need to be prepared for these interviews. Don't underestimate the time you need to, to, do, uh, to prepare for an interview and know your basics, data structures, algorithms, all these things. Um, that, that's the most important thing for ins interviews. It's not just Netflix. And for Netflix in particular, uh, I think what's very important is definitely the cultural fit. We have a very specific culture that is online uh, on a website. Uh, we have a culture deck, which has a lot of pages. Uh, and you, ha you have to, to fit culturally. So it's, it's not about a specific skill. Can you just elaborate on um, what you mean by fit culturally? So uh, we have a slide deck that Reed Hastings originally uh, hosted online on SlideShare, and we talk about the values at Netflix, and uh, like performance and inclusion, uh, team culture. We have we have a lot of different values, and if you don't fit within the, so it's it's diff it's clearly stated on the website, and the recruiters will also talk a lot about the culture uh, during the initial phase, and if you see that you're if the recruiters see that you're not a fit, or if you feel like 
you wouldn't feel comfortable in that environment, then you just should not apply. But I, I think it's, it's a good thing that it's clearly stated, but you know what to expect. And, um, and yeah, you, there's no surprise in the end. So you don't want to start in a company where you don't feel comfortable with, like one of the things is the performance, one of the like, recurring things about our culture is a performance, uh, the culture of performance. And if you don't feel comfortable and if you feel like you can't handle the pressure, then it doesn't make sense to, to go there. So I, I like that it's, that everything is clearly stated. So um, I imagine throughout your, your career, you've had to learn a lot of new things and may even probably still you're learning new stuff. Mm -hmm. what, what is your approach when you need to learn something new? So generally, um, regardless of whether it's tech or non-tech related, I, I go online, I look, I try to find online courses. I look up Coursera, edX, MIT, OpenCourseWare, anything I can find, or lynda.com also has good resources. I try to find these. Uh, if I can find courses, I try to block time every day. It usually doesn't work, but I try to, to, to stick to it. So I, I, I get some time in the morning, usually on the shuttle, because I go to, I drive, or I get to the office on the shuttle. So I try to block like 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening, uh, watch the videos, do the assignments, and uh, yeah, I try to do that regularly. And if you can find online courses, just, just search for tutorials or other sites that explain these things. And also try to find people uh, that you know, coworkers who know a little bit more about the subject and who can help you learn all these things. So one, one great thing um, I would recommend everyone here to do is if you don't have one yet, get a San Francisco Public Library card because that will give you access to a lot of things. You will get eBooks, audiobooks, uh, you can borrow them online. You get access to lynda.com. You get access to a whole lot of resources that you can use to learn a lot of things. So yeah, you should go get a library card. <laughs> that's what I've been telling my wife. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's pretty intense. Um, so we're right now working at Netflix. What does, what's your, what does your job entail? What are your current responsibilities? <clears throat> oh. I have to check my offer letter for <laughs> responsibilities, but so right now I'm working on um, on the next generation of our dynamic scripting platform. Um, we developed that platform to allow our device engineering teams to to create and uh, update their own endpoints, uh, their own API endpoints independently from the uh, runtime platform, so they could keep innovating at a at a high pace. So they could just write endpoints for their device and just changing the UI as, a, as they needed, independently from other teams and independently from the API platform team. And right now we're working on the next generation of that. It's a, it's a more sophisticated uh, platform as a service uh, with containers and where we try to enhance the developer experience. So make things even better for them. Uh, they are able to do local development with containers and then they can, put, they can uh, deploy this to production and it's the same on their environment and in production. They have better debugging, all these kinds of things. So I work on some specific parts of a project. One thing I'm currently working on is uh, what we call templated pipelines that we use for our uh, open source uh, continuous delivery uh, platform called Spinnaker. I have stickers here if you want some. Um, yeah, so that we can, so these template pipelines allow us to do things on behalf of the users. We abstract them away from, from the developers. But with those template pipelines, we can change the underlying infrastructure beneath them without them even knowing it. Uh, because they don't want to deal with that. They just want to work on their features and they don't care about, or they don't want to care about uh, the infrastructure or any oper operational concern. So I'm working on that with, uh, with another teammate and I'm working with, uh, with, a spinner, with some folks on the Spinnaker team to, um, to uh, add features for our use cases or fix issues when we find some corner cases. So that's also one thing uh, actually Yaz <coughs> is working on. They also use templated pipelines for, for their internal services. 
Uh, another thing that I was working on recently was uh, pipeline. Same thing in Spinnaker for uh, developers to canary their changes, so they can um, they should typically canary. So meaning they should verify that their that their new uh, version doesn't doesn't bring bad performance or or regressions in the system. So they can use that. They can just say, I want to verify my change before pushing it to production. And I have more more things coming on. Same thing on that same platform where we're adding more features, um, trying to make the developer's life easier. And that will be a, a, a cross-functional work with a lot of central teams at Netflix. So there is a lot of uh, batch four students. I'm a batch four student. We've just this is our third week in the program, so we're just. We're kind of we're new to this, and we've just been making some basic Bash scripts <coughs> and functions in C. Um, how, what are what are some key concepts that are required for large projects, huge projects like working with Netflix? Um, so, when we talk, if we talk about scalability, um, one. One one of the key concepts is understand horizontal versus vertical scaling. So in a nutshell, horizontal scaling is adding more uh, more nodes to your system, like more computers, basically, and vertical scaling is adding more resources to your to one node, like adding more RAM or adding more CPU. Um, there are several aspects to um, to scalability. To it's a multi-dimensional concern. There's is how many users you will have, what will be the growth of users, what will be the usage, uh, usage patterns, uh, your underlying system depends or, or service dependencies, um, capacity uh, management, all, all these, there's a lot of different concerns you have to think about. Um, you should definitely know the measures that you want to track, like, what would be your response time? What is your average and peak uh, performance, average and peak uh, load? So generally, you need to monitor your system, make sure that you have some kind of metrics, or some telemetry system in place, or use some monitoring applications, like uh, things like if you know Datadog or um, New Relic will do that for you. Uh, so definitely know, know the metrics in your system. Um, you, oh, there was something else I wanted to say related to that. I'll, I'll come back to it later. One thing, do not underestimate uh, your database uh, schema. So that's something you often over, uh, that might be overlooked, but definitely, especially if you deal with databases, don't overlook the, um, um, yeah, the database schema and the uh, the partitioning. These things. Uh, well, it's, it's also not just about scalability. Also, think about availability and reliability, especially since we we have a lot of things now in the cloud. Um, reli reliability is a big one, and of course, availability, especially for services like Netflix. There's there's so many different aspects. It's it's difficult, but. I have more. Uh, I'll probably I should look at my notes. Uh, I can tell you again after this talk. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's a, a whole lot of aspects you you need to think about. So um, in your span of your career, I'm sure you must. Um, I don't know if well I can't be sure, but have you would you consider that you made uh, some mistake throughout <coughs> your career and would you like to go back and change that mistake if you could yeah i'm sure i'll make a whole lot more <laughs> but uh there's especially two things i think that were mistakes and i probably would change uh one thing is i was uh, supervising and mentoring more junior engineers and uh, but i was I was still fairly, well, I was experienced in the sense that I had, I had been working all these years, but I was inexperienced related to mentoring. There was no formal course. There was no, I didn't have specific support. So I, I just helped them with problems. 
uh, but I was also focused on the things I had to do and focused on my own career. And in retrospect, I should have um, I should have been more selfless and and I should have taken more time to uh, to help them and provide them better support to make them uh, to help them be better engineers. So that's one of the things I would change. I would probably go back and probably learn more about mentoring and and take more time to to def to help them because yeah it's it's really important for for the next generation to to think about that so take take time to help people then and that's one one why oh, sorry that's one of the reasons why also I would I wanted to mentor for Holberton is like I want to help you guys succeed if you if, if I can I don't know but Hopefully, I, I will be able to help a little bit, mm -hmm. but yeah, um, take time, and if you can help people, it'll it'll help you too, and it, it will help me grow, and it would help you grow too. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing was uh, a while ago at my previous company in Germany, uh, my manager asked me if I wanted to be managing the team, and I didn't feel like I was ready for it, and as an engineer, you dread being a manager. It's like, oh no. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that ever. Uh, in retrospect, I probably should have tried. I don't know if it was serious, but at least I'm, I maybe should have given it a try, because I wouldn't. No, I don't know if that's something I would have liked or not. Uh, but maybe I should have given it a try and see if it's something I would have. I would have. Um, I would have been interested in doing. Okay. Um, just to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. So, in your point of view, um, how should a, like new budding engineers approach someone like you and ask for mentorship and support, things like that? Just ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just come and ask me uh, if, you have a, if you have a problem, if I can help with it, definitely come, come to me and ask. You, can, you know, you probably all know my Twitter handle, which, but I don't use Twitter that much, but uh, you, can ping me, uh, you can ping me via email or generally, or LinkedIn, any, any way you can. Or if you okay. want to, uh, ju yeah, just come to me and ask. That's that's not a big deal. I will tell you if I if I'm swamped in, in work, I will tell you, but I can't do it right now. Mm -hmm. But I will definitely uh, try to help you as soon as I can. Oh. So don't feel, um, yeah, don't hold back. If you if you want to ask something, feel free to come to me. That's really nice. <laughs> so. Um, Preparing for this interview, we were checking out your LinkedIn profile, mm -hmm. and Sue and I noticed something on there about an app for um, yeah. street cleaning and parking. Yeah. And we were just kind of curious what that was. Yeah, uh, that was way back then. So I have a three and a half year old now. So I used to have time a while ago, <laughs> like over four <laughs> years ago, I, I had time <laughs> to do things. Now I don't anymore. Uh, yeah, when I first came to the US, it was in 2010, I came to SF for my previous company. I worked on a project for three months and I stayed in the inner sunset and there was that thing, but I, I had a rental car. There was that thing I never, I've never seen before. You have to move your car out of the street like every couple of weeks, otherwise you'll get a ticket. <laughs> it's called st street cleaning. Uh, and yeah, that, that's, uh, that place where I was staying at, it had street cleaning I can't remember if it was every week or every other week, but I think I got a ticket or two. Um, so I thought nah, it might actually be convenient to remind yourself where you parked and what is the street cleaning day and when you should move your car. So that's when I started. I, I liked Android. I had an Android phone back then. I moved to an iPhone, but <laughs> I had an Android phone and I, I coded in Java, so Android development sounded pretty easy. So I thought oh, I'll start working on a street cleaning app. So I never released it but I use it internally for, for myself. You should, you should release it. <laughs> I've had friends who have got tic tickets. Yeah, uh, there, uh, yeah, since then there's been, a, I think there's a few um, street cleaning apps, some that will actually, what I wanted to do, will query some database, will tell you from the street where you are at, where you're parked, and depending on the street number, so on the street side, it'll be different street cleaning mm -hmm. day, so you can query your database to tell you from that street, from that side, when you should move your car. But it was too much work, and then I got a kid. I, was like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time for that anymore. And the other app was, well, that's download thing. Um, it's, let's say I was younger and I, I needed, I had a, 
a computer at home that could control certain, do queue up some things, some files to download. And I wanted to do it from my phone and not have to go to my computer and do it on my computer. So I was just experimenting with Android development. But yeah, it's pretty cool. You can, uh, it's, it's especially easy with Android because you don't have to, uh, you don't have to pay for the, you, you have a one-time fee. It's not like Apple where you have to pay every year. And it's in Java and I develop in Java. So that was, that was pretty obvious. So that's when I started those two apps. <laughs> I wish I could develop more apps, but <laughs> soon. <laughs> All right, so, um, so you've been working in the software industry for like 20 years now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what motivates you? What inspires you to show up to work every day? Uh, well, it's actually pretty cool to write software. It's, 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 it's actually really fun to be able to create something that, that you can use yourself or maybe thousands of people will use and even millions directly or indirectly like at Netflix. Uh, it's, it's really awesome. We couldn't do that 20, well, 20 years ago. You can, we could, but not at the same scale. Uh, it's, it's definitely fun. And um, if you're lucky enough to be able to do something that, that you will really enjoy and you have fun, doing then then yeah it's not really hard to wake up every day and go to work and we're definitely lucky in the tech industry especially there's so many opportunities right now yeah. and um, another thing is uh, I, I like learning new things tech or not tech non-tech and um, I'm lucky that at Netflix or generally at a big company you work with a lot of very smart people much smarter than me definitely mm -hmm. And you, you, you really learn a lot. So you will learn a lot from your peers. It, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be a big company, uh, even in a startup or any, any company, you will learn from other people. And I know that I, at Netflix in three years, I've learned a whole lot. And um, yeah, but definitely talk to your, to talk to your peers, talk, go to meetups and you will, you will definitely learn a lot. And finally, maybe the most important question. What is your current fa favorite Netflix series? Ah, current <laughs> one. Ah, so actually we just finished, uh, a few months ago we finished Orange is the New Black, is the New Black. We actually just finished The Blacklist, which is not a Netflix original, but <laughs> it's still has. I like the show. Uh, we started watching Narcos, so I really enjoy that. Uh, Narcos is a big one. And I can't wait for Stranger Things, which is coming next month, <laughs> season two. Um, that's for shows. Uh, I also like documentaries, especially food documentaries. And favorite one is, of course, Chef's Table. <laughs> so if you haven't watched it, watch it. It's really cool. But then you'll get super hungry. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at your pizza and like, uh, yeah, maybe I should do something else for dinner. <laughs> but yeah, it's a great show. Oh, that's, that's pretty great. I think um, that that mostly wraps up our inter the questions that we had for you, but uh, we would love if you interact with the audience today. Yeah, of course. And if you yeah, guys have any questions. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, just curious. I'm Brian. Hi. Hi Brian. Um, is there anything that you would share? with us that you wish somebody would have shared with you about the industry? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, it's about, really about sharing like a secret or something, but uh, I would say you should, as I was mentioning earlier, you should definitely try to not focus on yourself only, on your career or what you're doing, but take time to step back and look at look around you and uh, and try to help the uh, the people around you. I think is one big thing. Another big thing we've been addressing recently is uh, inclusion and diversity, and uh, and women in tech also more particularly. But um, things like that where you should definitely you're not necessarily there's often unconscious bias and you don't. As a, as a man specifically, you, you might have unconscious bias and you don't notice it. And we should, we should be, or at least try to be more conscious about all these things that are around us and that, that sometimes women are not 
it's harder for, for women in tech or they're not, it's, yeah, in some places where, or in some situations they don't feel comfortable, these kinds of things. So think about, think about all these things. That's one of, yeah, off the top of my head, that's what I would say. Hi, my name is Walton. Um, so you spoke about uh, the difference in context when you were working in Germany versus when you're working in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious on what were some of the mistakes that you made um, in terms of like clarification or uh, when you didn't have much context and uh, what, what did you learn from those mistakes? Um, that's a good question too. What, I don't know if I really made, well, probably some mistakes, but it's, probably that I didn't get my point across because I was I was not getting to the point right away so I was I, I've had that, that that happened to me a few times where I sent a fairly long email explaining everything why I was doing something or that I would be doing something and I didn't get a reply and it, it wasn't something critical but you you're ex I was expecting a reply so it's something I had to change in my communication style so it's not a big deal, but uh, yeah, that, that's definitely something I came across a few times, which made me think maybe I should I should work on my on my communication. So um, you said you worked in Germany and also America. So how mm -hmm. did working in the context of those two cultures you think uh, benefited you in your uh, career? Um, well, also also the fact that I'm French. Working different cultures will make you more. I think will make you more open-minded. Uh, yeah, you have, and especially now that I've read that book, the the culture map, I'm trying to be more aware of the differences in in culture, because especially you now in San Francisco or in the Bay Area, it's it's very multicultural. So you have people from all over the world with 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 different cultures and and different reactions to to different uh, settings. So I'm, tr I'm trying to be more aware of that because I, I worked in Germany for so long. I was so used to that. And then I came to the US and things were actually quite different. And it makes you, it makes you step back and think about how you should interact with people. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Um, Hi. So my background's in media, mm -hmm. and a lot of a part of a big part of that is television. Mm -hmm. So, as someone who's actually like in on the inside, what do you think Netflix's role, and I suppose other online streaming um, uh, websites, if you will, are going to look like now? For, um, excuse me, five years from now versus like how cable and broadcast is going to look, what kind of role um, or significance do you think Netflix is going to play in comparison to cable? Like, are we even going to have cable anymore? I, I would say I hope not <laughs> <laughs> for Netflix. But no, uh, I think as, I mean, you, you s probably saw it with the Emmy Awards. Streaming is, is getting bigger and bigger getting a lot of awards, a lot of attention. Everyone's getting into streaming now. Uh, I don't know, who, who has cable here? Anyone? Okay, one, two, <laughs> one. okay. It's like one percent. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, it's just so, so much more convenient. And we, we, I mean, we don't even have time for commercials. Who has time to watch commercials for five minutes every 20 minutes? Uh, yeah, I think it, it's going to play a big role in five years, so it's definitely going to be big. So if you want to join Netflix later, <laughs> we're hiring. Hi. Um, Thanks. Say you were uh, interviewing someone for a uh, software engineering position, and you asked them the question, why do you want to work, work for uh, Netflix? What would you be expecting to hear? What would I be expecting to hear? Um, I, I, I don't know if it's something I would be expect to hear, but I would want to see that you're passionate about what you would be doing, that you would really enjoy it, and 
um, that you would also enjoy working with the team you would be working on. So it's something that you might not think about, but definitely keep it in the back of your head. You will be working with a team. Uh, it's, I mean, it's great to be working for a big company, be it Google, Facebook, Netflix. But if you work on a team where you, don't, you, where you won't feel comfortable, it's not going to work. It's not going to work for you, and it's not going to work for the team. And it's just going to, it's probably going to waste your time in the end. Even if you work there and figure out it's not something you'll enjoy, then it, it's, it'll be time wasted. So I would, I would like to see that you're passionate about what you are doing and that you would enjoy working on that team and working on these tasks that you will be uh, interviewing for. Hi, my name is Kevin. Um, do you have a favorite technical question that you ask on an interview? Uh, I, don't, I don't do too many technical interviews. I haven't done them. I've done one recently, but it wasn't too technical. Yeah, I haven't done them in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's so many resources. There's a lot of resources out there, and they're all pretty good. I have to say I'm a big fan of of the way Holberton approaches things. We were talking about that earlier when I, when I came in the office. Um, I like that things are practical. I, need, I know you need to do those, you need to do the technical interviews and it, it's, it's fair game. Uh, but in the end, and I was just, just as I was saying, I, I've never implemented a binary tree at Netflix. It's like, not gonna, <laughs> no. <laughs> so you, you have to know all these things and you have to, to do them in an interview but I, I like that, that Holberton keeps the approach practical. You work on problems that you need to solve, which is exactly what we're doing day to day. I have a problem, I need to fix it. I need to, to solve it somehow, but probably not by implementing binary tree. <laughs> Hi. Yep. Over here, Shannon, yeah. So your, your day to day at Netflix, give us, tell us what you would do on your favorite day to day, like you've had an awesome day to day. What happened? Watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get uh, like one of these things, things I'm working on today, those, those templated pipelines. Uh, I've, I've had some, some, uh, some issues like design and then some, there were some corner cases that we found. And when you finally get it working, like you, you finally get it to work, you're close to finalizing your feature you know, you're gonna be able to push it out. That's 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 a little thing where you're super satisfied, and that's probably why a lot of you will will really enjoy doing software. You'll be you'll be working on problems, and that's when I, it comes back to um, to be being determined and resilient. Sometimes you'll want to bang your hand against the wall. You've been working on that thing; it's not working. Uh, sometimes you just have to step back so, or step away from the problem, do something else. Yeah. The solution will prob probably come, but yeah, when when you finally get to to go past all these roadblocks and you're you're able to get that thing working, that's where, when it gets super satisfying. And having silly discussions with uh, coworkers at lunch. Uh, hi, my name is Rich. Uh, I was wondering about. Um, well, I have two questions. One is about how you're saying mentoring or, or reaching out to others. Mm -hmm. I, I want to know like how that helps you in your own kind of like uh, personal development as a developer because yeah. spreading out to others, how does it help you as an individual? Um, um, and then also I was just curious about, I've read some stuff about the, I guess the culture and like heard about like the keeper tests at Netflix. Mm -hmm. and I, I kind of wanted to, to know like what that feels like on the inside, like yeah. I guess, yeah. Uh, great questions. Um, for the mentoring, it's two things at a personal level. Uh, one thing I said is, one thing in, in retrospect that I should have done better is better mentoring those engineers, help them grow. It's not, a, it's, I mean, it's a compet, to some extent there's some competition amongst engineers, but it's not, it's not that, it's not like you win the gold medal. So you should help the other guys. There's people on your teams, in other teams, you can, you can help anyone. And it, it'll help me, I think it'll help me grow as a person to be able to mentor people. 
be in, in tech or maybe not. Um, and I'll learn new things, I'll learn new perspectives. So it's, uh, again, being open-minded. Uh, you guys come from well, different places, I'm sure. So I'll, I'll learn things on a personal level, which will be uh, most likely very, uh, very good for me. Um, and it'll brush up on a few things, like if help you do uh, coding interviews or solve problems. It might give me ideas for other things I'm working on at the moment. So there's all these kinds of things that, are, that I'm thinking about. As for the Keeper test and the culture at Netflix, uh, it's, so again, check it out. It's on the website. You can check the culture deck. It's, I, it's very interesting. I definitely like it. Um, I did the Keeper test recently. I'm still there. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, for, for those who don't know, the Keeper test is uh, you ask your manager if they, uh, if something came up or you had another offer, w how much, how hard w would they work to keep you on the team? And yeah, and it can backfire if you want to do that. You could say, sorry, I'm not going to work that hard for you. Uh, I'm glad I'm still here, so that's good. Uh, so there's that culture of performance. You you have to like it. I I definitely always enjoyed working on tasks and and trying to finish my work in time. And I, I don't. It's it's hard to gauge performance generally, yeah. but if you do your work well and you're you're a team player, that generally it shouldn't be a big deal. So it's very intimidating. That's for sure. So when I when I had the offer from Netflix, I I paused a little bit. I was like, okay, I my my kid was like six months old, uh, seven months old. It was a I I just had my green card and I thought, what if it doesn't work out? It means I I mean when you look at the culture, it means if you're not an A player, you'll get a good severance package, but then you will move on. And I'm like, I have a kid, seven months old, and I'll need to find if it doesn't work out, I'll need to find another job. Um, it's intimidating, but I would say try to step out of your comfort zone. It's hard, it's super hard, but that's, that's how you definitely grow. Once you step out of your comfort zone, it's, it's the only way you'll, or it's not the only way, but it'll definitely help you grow. Hey, how's it going? Hi. I'm Demetrius. Uh, I just wanted to know like, what kind of personal practices and habits uh, you put into place to be as productive as you can uh, possibly be. Like, I, I could be more productive. I should be more productive. Uh, I'm definitely still working on it. Uh, t oh, yeah, that's one of the things I forgot about um, when you asked about uh, good, uh, good engineers. Uh, time and task management. I'm still working on it. Not that great at it. Uh, or and focus. So you st you need to stay focused on what you're working on. And I know I tend to sometimes work on something and then I get distracted by some other things that are happening, like Slack channel support issues. Or sometimes I'm not even on call and I'll I'll jump on it. I'll see a, I'll see a Slack message on the ch support channel and I look at it and I'll answer it. And I'm, I these are things I need to hold back on. I should focus on my work. So one thing that is helping me right now is the Pomodoro technique, where you uh, take a timer, basically you take a timer, you set 25 minutes or whatever amount of time you want, and you focus on that task that you're working on and, um, and avoid distractions. So try to not look at cell phone, Slack, turn off Slack, um, focus on it 25 minutes and then you take a break and then you can switch to another task or or uh, keep working on the task in for 25 minutes. So that definitely helps. And uh, one thing, I, a course I did on Coursera last week, a couple of weeks ago, was um, learning how to learn. Very, very interesting. They had a, a few of these. I mentioned the Pomodoro technique and, and a few tips to, um, to get, to make you better at learning. So it's not necessarily, a, doesn't necessarily apply to being efficient, but it, there's a few uh, good gems hidden in there. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Aaron. Uh, it's the first time here to this meetup. Um, just a quick question about, because I know uh, I, I read the slide deck before. It's really infamous for just like, um, you know, being on top of your game and have um, emphasis on performance. So just a yeah. question kind of related to your um, answer about time management, but it's more about pressure, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you have work pressure to perform, but also you, you mentioned you have a kid at home. So um, there's a lot of pressure, I guess. Everyone has a lot of pressure in life. So just curious, um, how do you manage you know, like uh, pressures in life and pressures job and just um, self-care, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say, or it might be different depending on the team. Some, some teams are definitely probably are de have definitely more pressure because they're in the um, they're in tier one, so they're in the path of streaming. If something goes down in their service, then Netflix goes down. So there's definitely more pressure here. We work with internal engineers, so there's less pressure, definitely. Um, although we are to some extent also in the tier one. Um, but generally, the, the work-life balance on Netflix is pretty good. Um, the, the nice thing is I, I uh, live in the city, but the office is in Los Gatos, and I commute there every day. We have a shuttle, and we have two shuttles in the morning, two shuttles in the evening. And that's that's it. So if you don't drive, you take your shuttle, you get home. I still work in the evening, so whenever there's something I want to finish, but no one forces me to. And uh, and usually the managers are really good at it. They will uh, they will not they will really not really put pressure on you. And and that's that's the thing of the culture. It's about freedom and responsibility. You have a freedom to work more or less how you want, but then you have a responsibility that comes with it. So. You can slack off for two days, uh, but if you don't deliver in the end, that's your responsibility. I don't slack off for two days just for <laughs> Hi, I'm hey. Jacob. Um, so at first glance, Netflix seems to be a company more so than other technology companies that are very uh, user focused. Mm -hmm. So you have to do a lot of uh, analyzing data. Uh, it seems to me that uh, Netflix was the first to gain true insight into user viewing habits, right? Because before we had Nielsen ratings and how really accurate could those be when they're guesses, right? Yeah, right. And that really has a big impact on uh, how much television deals cost. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you have to uh, worry about UX. So there's marketing, there's data analysis. In your teams, are there people who are not software engineers that you're working with more so than other technology companies or are there software engineers that are uh, cross-discipline? Um, not specifically in my team, at least not my direct team. Um, there are non-software engineers. We have designers, we have, we have um, consumer insights people who I don't believe are, uh, are engineers. Um, so we have a lot of different non-engineer um, teams at Netflix. Would you say more so than, uh, you know, before I came here, I very knew very little about doc, like Docker, right? Mm -hmm. And I still don't, I'm not super, <laughs> right? I, I don't know. But the average person doesn't know who Docker is. <laughs> so is your company ha uh, blending more disciplines together than a uh, another company that would possibly be have teams where it's all engineers. Yeah, I think so. It's I mean, we're not just a, a tech company. We're also a big media company. So we have a lot of media focus or we have a lot of, of teams that are non-engineering. There's a whole lot of engineers, but I can't, I don't know exactly how many, but uh, there's still a good chunk of a company that is non-engineer. So I know we're probably wrapping it up, but um, my question is less so about like the culture mm -hmm. of the company, because we know that it's great. But in terms of uh, the business side, Netflix is the most household name of streaming services online. I mean, don't quote me on that, but like, come on. So um, my question is, what is it in your opinion that really why is it Netflix that is so successful compared to like Hulu or that cr 
what is it like crunch roll whatever the one that holds all the anime stuff like what is it that sets netflix apart um i there's several things i think we we're trying we're keeping the focus on the on the core business we're not trying to do we're not trying to do a bunch of different things like trying to go into businesses that is not core streaming and entertainment um, every, occasionally we are we have a occasionally we can ask three days things questions and things sometimes keep coming up and he usually says we want to keep focusing on the core business and that's uh, and I love that it's great it's it's good for the company and it's good for the users and the other thing as you mentioned was the um, the focus on the users we want the users to have the best possible experience and and have fun and have great shows and then watch great shows and uh, yeah, that's what I think makes uh, sets Netflix apart. Um, so I assume French is your native language. Yes. Um, did you also learn German? Yes. So how German. did you handle the transition going from French to German? <laughs> or did they speak German when you were working in Germany? Or oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I actually was in a French-German high school, right at the border of France and Germany. It was in Germany. And I thought I knew German. <laughs> so yeah, I had like five years of German in high school. I can speak German. Yeah, and then I started in the country. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I started working. I, I was working in a, um, I was working in a nightclub on the weekends to make some money. I was working as an intern at that tech company. And yeah, they didn't, well, s they would speak English maybe a little bit in the tech company, but, uh, and actually I studied, in, I studied at the university in Germany because I thought, yeah, I did five years of high school German. I can do German. And yeah, it's not, it wasn't, so it was hard at the beginning, but because I lived in Germany and I was talking German or I was, was trying to talk German all the time and people would only talk in German, then you just start picking it up. So it's all about practice. In the end, being in the country, having to practice every day, having to talk every day, you pick up all these small things and, uh, and you start actually getting to speak German for real. So yeah, but it was, it was it's a good question. But yeah, it was hard, but it worked out. And I still try to practice. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of French people at Netflix, there's also a lot of German people and I try to meet with them once a month and, and speak German. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Good. How are you? Um, my name's Kingsley, and uh, it's my first time here. Um, you might have spoke about this already, so if you already did, I'll just find out from somebody else. Um, I can answer again. Okay, cool. Um, so what's your, what, what's your tech stack? Like, what technologies do you work with? And how does that figure into the whole Netflix streaming ecosystem on your side? Well, like, where am I in the... Where are you? What do you do? <laughs> want the details. Uh, yeah. So uh, I work mostly with Java. Also, we have some um, tooling in um, Node.js. Uh, we're using Docker, as well, generally containers uh, heavily. We have everything in the cloud in AWS. Uh, so I... you don't really see the part where I'm working on, but um, to work on that, I don't know if you were there at the beginning, I mentioned I'm um, working on the next generation of our dynamic scripting platform. So basically teams, device teams can write their own API endpoints. So what you see on your phone, um, like the, uh, the list of movies or the list of, of shows, that's the device making call, API calls to retrieve a bunch of data and they can display on the screen. And every team can do their, they, they write their own custom endpoints because you have device, uh, you have different uh, screen real estate on, the, on different devices. So we provide the platform to allow them to write their own endpoints. What's Docker for? So that's for that new generation platform, that new uh, platform as a service. So they can, the, uh, the endpoints are now self contained in a container. Any more uh, questions? questions? Thank you. Welcome.
Okay. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the great questions.